Henry, thank you for making the time to uh, meet with me today. Thanks for having um, me. I'm a, I'm a second D on the on the blockchain rock team. So um, <laughs> go blockchain rock. <laughs> thank you. So please tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, tell sure. us a bit about your story uh, since childhood, if you can. Well, excellent. No, first of all, thanks for having me on board on blockchain rock. Uh, no, obviously, my name is Henry Arsling, and really, my passion, and my focus in life is the future of the financial services industry. And I'm very lucky I do this right now, wearing a couple hats. One of them is at PwC, where I run our fintech and crypto practice based out of Hong Kong. But also then in my academic life, where I'm a adjunct associate professor at the uh, University of Hong Kong, where I teach the first fintech university course in Asia. And then also in my civil society hat, where I'm the chairman of the fintech association here in Hong Kong, and among many other things. So really uh, being very able to focus on this on a personal and full-time professional basis as well. My quick uh, story is really, uh, I'm, I'm actually uh, born in Montreal, Canada, and my background is Armenian. Uh, so, you know, grew up in a very traditional uh, Armenian background in Montreal. Um, became, went to law school, became a lawyer, did a graduate degree in law, did my New York bar, my Canadian bar, uh, and then I was working one of the lot of the large law firms in Canada, and uh, I was supposed to go to London uh, to do a graduate degree. Well, frankly, I was looking at it as a kind of a year off, but uh, disguising it as a graduate degree for uh, graduate studies. And, um, and I saw this documentary on TV called The Rise of a Chinese Dragon. And this was 2004 or five, and really China was not as uh, sexy as it is today, but it was the early days of a China boom. And I literally put my application for London, put it in a drawer, went on Google, which was still taking off at the time, and looked for programs in China. And literally the next day I bought a book called Chinese for Dummies. Mm -hmm. And I was on a plane to Beijing where I learned to count next to this uh, old Chinese woman taught me how to count from one to ten. Uh, I landed in Beijing, took me four hours to go to my university dorms and so on and so forth. And so I learned Chinese for a couple months at uh, Beijing University, went on to do a master's in Chinese law at Tsinghua University. And then just obviously uh, it was the best decision of my life. Um, I was very lucky at the time. When I was younger, I used to be, I used to fence, I used to be in a fencing team. Oh, right. And at the time I went back to Canada and uh, I just got approached by the Canadian Olympic Committee and said, Henry, we're looking for somebody that understands Chinese, has experience in China as a former athlete. So I went back to the Olympic Games as uh, you know, heading and helping with the logistics of the Canadian team. Uh, and then after the Olympics, I came to Hong Kong, uh, worked as a law firm, as a lawyer for a couple of years, uh, covering the financial markets and hedge fund industry. And then at the time that I joined uh, UBS, the investment bank, uh, where really I uh, focus on the hedge fund industry, uh, consulting capacity, and I loved investment banking. Really, to this day, I had fabulous uh, years there. But then I was realizing that, you know, banks are not innovating fast enough. You know, there was a disconnect with what's happening in tech world and the innovation that was coming through and what was happening in banking world. And I really believed that there was uh, something was going to happen. And I started getting into um, fintech, and this was really the early days of fintech. I used to organize the first fintech dinners in Hong Kong, wow. uh, where I kid you not, uh, I couldn't get eight people around the table. To the point I would tell some of my colleagues, come out, pay your dinner, just be there so I don't lose face with the number of people there. And uh, we really had a couple of, uh, we, it really started as a group of people meeting out for dinners mm -hmm. in one of the Chinese restaurants here under this building actually. Uh, and then uh, it went on to a WhatsApp group called the Fintech Aficionados. And that group literally that was initially only for four or five people to share information that we were seeing, I mean, now morph into the FinTech Association of Hong Kong, which I'm the chairman of, That's where we have 1,000 turn of members representing over 400 different entities, including all the big organizations from regulators and government bodies. So it's been quite an interesting uh, journey from that side. Uh, but then, you know, I left uh, banking, went to a startup that unfortunately didn't work out, uh, and then I didn't know what to do. I was like, do I go back to my being a lawyer? Do I go back to a bank banker? Do I launch my own startup? And then so PwC approached me and said, Henry, we're looking for somebody to run our practice in FinTech. Would you be interested? And they promised me it was gonna be entrepreneurial. And I have to say, it's been quite a quite interesting journey since then for the last two years where uh, you know we run our FinTech business, but also very excitingly, our uh, crypto practice, um, you know, which I oversee at a global level now. It's been very, very exciting. Uh, you know, we're advising numerous crypto exchanges, crypto funds, ICOs, STOs, stable coins, uh, tech firms getting into crypto, uh, banks getting into crypto, governments and regulators on crypto, and it's been really fascinating building this business from the ground up. So uh, very exciting that I can mirror what is generally my passion uh, into my day job, and uh, you know what I do on my weekends now, 
uh, as I spend a lot of time writing. My next book is coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm very proud to say that it's already on the best-selling list of Amazon. It's the only book that is not released yet that is on the best-selling list. Can you share the title? Yeah, it's called The Future of Finance. Okay. So it's pretty straightforward where we talk about uh, the impact that fintech, uh, artificial intelligence, and crypto Amazing. is going to have on the future of finance. So it's about a 350-page book. as a 100 page each on the basics of all these topics. So my goal is anybody who reads the book has a good understanding of fintech, AI, and crypto. And then what we talk about in the book is how is the impact of these three coming together going to have on the future of finance. Ironically, one of the big topics we cover in the book is how tech firms may get into crypto or launch their own cryptocurrency. And that may be a game changer. And uh, the book was written a couple months ago, huh? and um, it takes some time before it's published. And now with the news we've had the last couple of days with uh, Libra and Facebook Coin, again, just uh, confirms our thesis that we had in the book. So very interesting. I'm very excited about the book, and hopefully... Our goal is to democratize access to knowledge when it comes to these topics. So very excited to see the book come out. That's a remarkable journey you've, you've been on. You've obviously seen the start of fintech and you've incubated almost a fintech uh, association and group and yeah. movement almost in, in Hong Kong. Yeah. So what, what do you see are the past trends in fintech, blockchain, DLT, versus the future trends? How do you see this continuing to transition? It's a good question. I think there's a lot of, uh, in the early days of FinTech, I think a lot of people were experimenting with FinTech. For example, uh, on the B2C level, a lot of companies were trying to go directly to consumers. Uh, what we've seen in that front is really the game changer did not come from FinTech startups, but really came from large technology firms, the tech fin firms, you know, the Alibabas, the Tencent of this world, and China as a role model for that uh, globally, you know, and they really show us that uh, at scale, these companies can make a big difference. I mean, if you look at platforms like WeChat today, mm -hmm. um, that WeChat today has a billion monthly active users, which is quite remarkable. And what's even bigger than that is, according to some sources, uh, one user out of three of WeChat uses the app more than four hours a day, which is really incredible. But what I also think it was a good wake up call for the banks. For example, the banks, when it comes to the mobile payment space in China, were a bit late to the game. And the tech firms came and really dominated the space. Today, the mobile payment market last year in China was around the 23 trillion US dollar market. 90% of that is owned by two technology firms, uh, Ant and, uh, and Tencent. So it shows you again how the disruption these players can have. Um, when it comes to other levels, uh, for example, we've seen a lot of trends initially, uh, a lot of banks were experimenting with uh, fintech. A lot of them were launching innovation teams, innovation labs. Um, what we've seen in generally, a lot of these were not as successful, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of the organizations were trying to launch innovation labs, trying to do accelerators. Many of these, unfortunately, were done purely for public relations, for marketing, for PR, which is great from that perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, but very few projects went um, past the proof of concept, went to pilot or production globally. Yeah. And actually, unfortunately, the people that paid the price of these were the fintech startups that were doing B2B. Many of them went to a bank, spent the limited resources they had trying to work with the banks in the proof of concepts. Unfortunately, many of these banks, did, the projects didn't go through to production or, or uh, you know, being deployed. So I think that's been a very interesting dilemma. Uh, the banks still have changed their approach to fintech as well. And initially, many of them were trying to experiment with fintech. Now we're seeing a lot of banks close down their innovation labs, innovation teams, try to embed innovation inside the organization. But the big trend I think we're seeing right now, and Hong Kong is probably leading on that, is banks realizing it's very difficult to change the legacy systems and the spaghetti mm -hmm. of the bank and completely launching new entities on the side that are completely digital first. As consortiums? Uh, consortiums are often new, standalone, oh, purely right. digital banks. I mean, look at the great example here in Hong Kong, for example, is uh, Standard Charter. Right. I mean, obviously, it's a large organization with a lot of legacy systems, a lot of spaghetti there in the back end. And also, frankly, the processes, the management, the way people think about it, um, to launching now a new uh, virtual bank that is frankly, that uses zero of the systems of the traditional bank. Mm -hmm. It's all cloud-based, all new, uh, new management, new, new way of thinking. And really, I believe over time, these are the banks that will take over. And I think Hong Kong is gonna become a blueprint for the future of digital banks. I mean, as you may know, in Hong Kong now, the central bank has approved eight new uh, digital banks. Yeah. And um, not these include not only uh, digital-only offerings from traditional incumbents, but also those from tech firms. 
yeah. you know, all Tencent, Alibaba, they all have uh, uh, this Dogan are all licensees, but also some of the fintech startup, startup themselves, like WeLab, for example. And I, I think it's gonna be very interesting in the next couple of months uh, to see how the impact these are gonna have. I really believe the new metric would be to get onboarded, would be you need to get onboarded in less than 10 minutes, uh, fully digitally. I don't understand why would somebody go to physically to a branch in a couple months. Mm -hmm. I believe in 2019, the fact that I still have to go physically to a bank branch is a failure on the behalf of the bank. Yeah. And I think hopefully this will be a wake up call to many of the banks, not only in Hong Kong, in, the, in Asia, but also globally. And there's a lot of work to be done. You know, I got yesterday, I just moved apartments in Hong Kong and uh, I got a letter from my bank saying me that my change of address was not approved because my signature <laughs> didn't match my specimen signature they haven't filed. And frankly, this is embarrassing. In 2019, we're still relying on that. It's an insult to their customers. Um, I've been a client with my uh, many of my banks here in Hong Kong for more than 10 years. And being a fintech guy, I open accounts with everybody to test my user experience. Sure. And uh, the banks still send me offers. They do KYC, but they don't know who the customer is. They have no idea what I do. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, it's, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. That's true. So tell me how you you also have a personal side. You you travel the world. You're a, a great uh, representative for fintech and blockchain generally. Um, how do you balance your your personal life with your professional life? Yeah, it's a good question. I get asked this a lot, and uh, you know about the work life balance and how to manage the, the personal obligation, the family life, and also our personal obligations. I, I don't have a good answer to that, unfortunately. I, I, I'm not a personally big believer of work-life balance. Mm -hmm. I think that if uh, you want to be successful, especially in your younger days in your career, unfortunately, you need to focus more on your career. And uh, I'm not a big believer of work-life balance. I believe in work-life ba harmony, mm -hmm. where you try to embed. Uh, personally, I work most weekends. Uh, my work-life balance is not there, but I really believe that your extra 10% of effort you put in gives you your 20 to 30% uh, out, outward, you know, um, I was really see, uh, won, won an award by one of the universities here, and my message to the students was that in your first uh, years of your life, honestly, if you think you're going to have work life balance, uh, unless you're uh, you're very smart and you're able to create stuff, I do not believe that's actually possible. Think about the young lawyers at uh, law firms or even at our business. I really believe that's not possible. I always believe in life. There's three elements that are always in conflict. One is uh, time, one is energy, and one is money. Mm -hmm. Time, energy, money, and I think you're always going to have in your life two of them at the same time. You know, when you're young, you have time and you have energy, but you don't have any money. Yeah. Later on in your career, you may have money and you may have energy, but you don't have time. And then you, later on in your life, you have the time and uh, but you have the money, but you're not the energy. Correct. So I think Correct. that's why I don't believe you need kind of the harmony uh, to find it. I personally enjoy. I mean, if you tell me I'm going to be on vacation next week, what I would do, I would probably read about crypto. Yeah. So it's a bit of a conflict yeah. from that perspective. Um, what I do generally with my travels and everything, obviously, uh, due to my job, uh, I travel quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I found it's very difficult, and I frankly, I don't have a solution on that. What I find works out well for me is uh, trying to keep certain balances, like going to the gym, working out, eating healthy, um, and trying to spend, uh, have sacred moments for my family, which I tend to be the Sunday. So Sunday is uh, being Armenian, we're quite... Uh, good religious Christians, you know, so we try to go to the church and being keeping it uh, from that perspective, family being very important. Uh, but honestly, I don't have a right answer to that. I really don't believe in it. I really believe There's no in right it. answer. I think. And I honestly believe it's very hypercritical from a lot of organizations when we try to pitch to the young people that you're going to have the work-life balance and be successful. Mm -hmm. I think if you want to do nine to five and have your weekends, your evenings off, it's great. And you kind of, I think, a very meaningful career. And if you want that, great. But I really believe it's difficult to be a leader in your field uh, or a leader in your industry, especially in service-oriented industry where the client is always a priority, whether law firms or consulting firms, because your client directs your agenda. You know, if I tell my clients in crypto that I, I'm not going to be able to deliver uh, what I was promised them, I'll be two days late because I want to have a work-life balance and not work on evenings, they tell me, hey, Henry, it's very good, but uh, I want my project done. So I think we have to be very careful. That's going to be a very big balance for enterprises, corporations, to try to find the right balance over the coming months. Because I think for a lot of young people coming in inside organizations, um, this is something that matters more. To when, even I'm sure you're a young, young lawyer, and the idea of, uh, you know, of not working hard didn't exist. And so I think it's going to be very interesting what happens. But personally, at this point in my career, I do not believe that it's... Um, I wouldn't say I'm a big believer in work-life balance. Mm -hmm. I believe in work-life harmony. I think if you do what you love, uh, having work-life harmony 
actually is a, is a pretty good uh, outcome and that allows to be successful at the same time. That's, that's a great response. Yeah. And finally, what is your vision for the future? Very, very broadly. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's very tough to know what the future is. I think there's a lot of uh, elements in the world right now that are very uh, sensitive. But I really, I'm very bullish when it comes to finance. I really believe we are right now in the most exciting time in financial services history. Mm -hmm. People are going to look back at this point in time in history and say, wow, this was a p turning point in the evolution of money and finance. Um, some of the big things I'm watching right now is what's happening in the digital asset space. I really believe the announcements that we had a couple of days ago with Libra and Facebook Coin and other announcements of the likes are game changing. Uh, the announcement of Facebook launching its own currency, I believe since the literally the white paper from Satoshi Nakamoto, this is the biggest other innovation we've had in the past the, the decade or so. I believe it's a game changer. I'm very bullish on that. I'm also I'm very bullish on the large tech platforms and what's going to enable, enable us. Mm -hmm. um, but also what's really exciting me right now is uh, what users are going to be able to benefit. For example, uh, banks and financial health. Today, uh, you know, it's very incredible that, that almost 40% of Americans don't have $400 in their bank account. You know, um, you have uh, one American out of four, I believe, does not even have any savings. You know, it's the same data every country in the world. That's, many countries don't take the data. That's why the U.S. we have the data from. I really believe we're going to move to an era of financial health, and I really hope these new challenger banks, virtual banks, or fintech are going to be able to help us. For example, I'll go to the gym for my physical health. I'll meditate or I pray for my spiritual or my mental health. Why am I not using fintech for my financial health? Mm -hmm. And I really believe that we're going to have an era where I will be able to be financially healthy because of fintech. Today, if I, I, uh, I use my credit cards, I'm late, late on my loan payments, I use overdraft, I'm a great customer for a bank. But that's not necessarily good for me. I think the interests of banks on the retail side and customers are misaligned. And hopefully we'll be able to change this. I think at a bigger level, what I'm really watching right now, and it's a topic of my, of my book that's coming out in, on August, uh, uh, the first week of August, is really the combination of fintech, artificial intelligence and crypto. And I think the combination, while these verticals on their own are very powerful, is a combination of these three that gives an outsized impact. It's not a one plus one plus one equal three, it's a one plus one plus one equal, you know, uh, 23 that we're gonna have. For example, monetizing data. Today, I'll be using Facebook or Google and I give away my data for free in exchange to be able to use the app or use the search engine. Shareholders of these companies making great money, but as a user, I'm not benefiting. I really believe we're going to move to an era that I'll be able to leverage and monetize my data. For example, uh, if I do, uh, you know, I'm going to be able to share my data and be compensated for it. There'll be micro payments that will happen in crypto, and I think that's one of the big announcements we had yesterday. It will be going to the catalyst, but also uh, using artificial intelligence to price that data. For example, if I have a nine to five job and I relax on weekends, my data is very generic. Maybe it's not worth a lot, but maybe I'm a triathlete or I'm a mountain climber and my data is worth more to some. And artificial intelligence would allow us to actually monetize and price this data accordingly in a dynamic way. And I, this is only possible with FinTech, I mean the platforms to do so, with crypto, with micropayments, and artificial intelligence to do so as well. So I think that's one of the beauty of future of finance we're heading. The other element is really what we're seeing right now with the machine to machine economy. Uh, this is really exciting and uh, for example today I'm going to have soon my uh, smart fridge who will be analyzing my eating patterns mm -hmm. and maybe you know today when I go to the grocery store my time of purchase is only a 20 minutes period where I go and I buy the eggs at whatever price is offered to me but what if my smart fridge knows what I'm going to eat and actually can start making online my payments of eggs in advance and maybe because of that they can actually buy my eggs in, you know, in the future, in, in advance, and be able to get better pricing for me. They're continuously buying. Yeah. So, and these payments will happen in micropayments in crypto. It'll be fully behind the scenes. I will not even notice it. Maybe the delivery will happen to me on drones or by self-driving cars. And I think we're going to have this whole economy in the back end that will happen seamlessly in crypto and dependently. For example, my smart fridge selling my data to a provider. In exchange of it, I'll be compensated. My self-driving card will go somewhere and get uh, recharged automatically and pay for the crypto and it will happen automatically. I think we'll have an optimization of these resources that's going to happen. And that's very, very exciting. And some of the catalysts for that, I think, especially with 5G coming out, that's a very exciting uh, technology enabled that enables us. I think that's also one of the reasons we're seeing some of the geopolitical tensions right now. 
Um, you know, spending a lot of time in the US and in, in Asia, uh, I think 5G is really one of the big game changers that's gonna enable some of these things that I just mentioned. So I think we're coming up to a very big uh, point on that side. What's worrying me today globally, um, I think there's a lot of exciting things in addition to what I mentioned, the financial inclusion and a lot of other things are coming up. I'm becoming more worried about geopolitical tensions because technology now, stuff like 5G is so much more ahead. How is this gonna react geopolitically? Uh, and also then how we're gonna make sure that the wealth and the benefits that we're getting from these new innovations are distributed in a more equal fashion. And obviously the world, if you don't have the data, you don't have the AI, uh, it makes it very difficult. So I think we're gonna have some countries that have AI, that have tech firms uh, lead on this. And I think we're gonna have a lot of new challenges on that side that are coming up. So I'm very optimistic. Again, this is the most exciting time uh, to be in finance, uh, to be a lawyer. Uh, I really believe this is really exciting from that perspective. That's a, a wonderful insight. I've never heard that type of future vision. But, well, I'll talk about it in my book if anybody's interested. Yeah, I want to <laughs> so it's, it's, all, it's all in there. So. <laughs> Henry. Thank you very much. Thank Great you. to have you on Thank board. You. Blockchain rocks. I'm very excited to be on. Thank you. Thank you.